Okay, so we're recording this uh, session now. So let's get start started. Welcome, everybody. So we've got about 30 people, I'm sure. Some more will join um, later on. So it's nice to see. I'm really excited to get started with uh, this series of, uh, you know, modules. Um, and really, for me, the aim is to uh, transmit as much of the knowledge of 424 as possible. So we will not do much theory here. Uh, the aim really is for me to explain uh, to all of you uh, the tools we are using, the, the process, the engineering behind 424. Uh, and, and by the way, everything that I'm going to use is material from 424. And it's also material that you can all access. Okay. So everything I'm going to show uh, and all the tools are tools that we've developed, open source tools that are completely accessible. And I'll explain us also how you can access these tools. I'll explain how we, um, what we do with them, uh, how we work, how we develop 424, uh, tell about the story. So this is, this is my way of you know, teaching engineering. Really, it's about 424 and, and, uh, and transmitting that knowledge. So the way it's going to work is, so today is two hours. We'll see, we'll see if we cut it a bit short or if we keep it to two hours. Um, it's the first uh, module, which is simulation and modeling. We'll have, in total, there is eight modules that I can uh, present. Maybe it will be shortened to six or seven, I'm not sure. I will do one every week from now on. And it might be that one week I cannot do it, but anyway, expect nearly every week uh, to have a, a module where we can meet again and all the modules will be recorded. Uh, and shared on the on the WhatsApp community. We've got 35 people now, so that's nice. And, bef and today I will spend maybe 10 minutes explaining, you know, what the team is about, what 424 is about, just to make sure everyone's on the same page. And after that, I'll dive into the um, the topic of today. I have sections, different sort of. Um, modeling tools and uh, simulation tools that I want to present to you. And after each section, I will do some question and answer. So I'll, I'll let you ask any question you may have about what we've discussed, just to try and make it interactive. So I will not wait for the end to have questions and answers. We'll do it uh, throughout. But before I start, be really interested to, uh, to know who is basically what our audience is is here tonight. Uh, one thing that I always like to see is how far the 424 is spread, you know, in terms of um, uh, globally. So we're going to we're going to do a little game here. I'd, I'd be interested to see if we can make this work. So uh, you, you can see you've got like a hand to raise your hand, basically, option. Um, so can you all raise your hands? Just just all raise your hands. Yeah, it's all working. OK. Put your hand down, please. OK, great. Let's, um, so all hands down. Let's, um, let's see how far, let's see who, who is the furthest away from. So I'm in the UK. I'd be interested to see who is, who is outside of Europe here. Anybody? OK, so a few. OK, who's from, uh, who's from America? Anybody from the uh, from America or the American continent? Okay, so a few as well. So I, I know there's a few people from Brazil uh, because Augusto has been uh, doing a good job in uh, you know sharing the sharing our uh, message. Augusto is actually on the picture you see here. He's on my left on the picture and he's uh, he's a, a test driver for 424. And uh, he's talking about 44 uh, in a community in Brazil, I, I, I believe. Okay, uh, hands down. So now, who's anybody from Africa? I know there's uh, a couple of people. Yeah. Okay. Okay, a few people from uh, Africa. That's fantastic. And I know somebody's from uh, Kenya, and there's a few more. Okay, great. Uh, anybody from Asia joining us? Yeah, 
so i know that with asia the time is not great because it's night time at the moment but okay a couple of people nice anybody from australia or that part of the world maybe not tonight okay and then obviously the rest is from europe we've got a big french community here uh yeah french okay and <laughs> few people from the UK, I'm sure. Okay, great. So you see, this is really exciting for me because this is exactly what I want to create. I want to create a team that really is, is spread and goes as far as possible. Um, and it's, it's about decentralization. It's about a distributed team, you know, coming together around this project. And, you know, it's so nice for me to see people from from around the world this way. So, so let me uh, let me talk about the team a little bit before we start on the engineering. So, first of all, this website you see here is discover.pairing.com. I'm sure most of you know about this website, but I wanted to. Uh, so, so the the module and everything I'll talk about tonight uh, is on this website. Okay, so all the material you can find it on discover.pairing.com. It's a website that's keeps evolving. I put new material all the time on it. Uh, Alex from Alex on this picture here, uh, helping with social media and, and developing this website as well. Um, so please come on this website and uh, I'll show you exactly where the material that we, we will use tonight is. But just quickly, I will spend a little time again saying what 424 is, what I'm trying to achieve here. So it started really of the ambition to go racing at Le Mans 24 hours. Uh, I, I worked at Le Mans uh, more than 20 years ago. I absolutely loved it. For me, it's the best race in the world. And when I left Le Mans for Formula One, I always thought I'll have to come back with my own car. So I started Perrin Limited 13 years ago, and really it was about doing a car for Le Mans. But very quickly, it changed into something bigger and the team was the thing that really interested me more. Um, just not just just not only the car. I don't want to be a car manufacturer. I don't want to sell cars. I want to build a machine that can build a machine. Okay. It's about the team. But it's a team that's completely different to the tradi traditional racing team that you can see on, on the Formula One grid or uh, racing on TV. All these teams, by the way, that exist have been invented before the internet existed. So for for us, Perrin is a team, it's it's a community-based, it's a network, it's open source as much as we can. Not everything will be open source in the car. I'll explain why, but you, you understand that we have the opportunity here to do something completely different and much, much bigger. And I believe this will give us the platform to innovate faster, to transmit knowledge you know, to more people, to give accessibility to motorsport and engineering in a new way. So that's what we're doing to, tonight. But I've been doing it for years. I'm just trying to find the best way to engage people. When it comes to designing a car like 424, it's not, it's not very easy to engage you know, a big community of people because it takes experience. You know, it took me 20 years to learn how to design such a car. So I can't expect a huge number of people coming to design the car with me. But what I can expect is a small team so i on this picture you know that strategy has paid off because on the internet we met uh we i met 10 15 people they're not all on this picture by the way but i've got august on my left i've got damien on my right here they are two test drivers they are driving 424 on a weekly basis every time we need to do a test i'll explain later on how how our process works how do we test this car virtually with people who are Damien lives in Poland, Augusto lives in Abu Dhabi. How does it work? And then behind me, uh, to the basically the left at the back, is Eddie. Eddie is a Spanish guy I met on the internet and is uh, is the uh, basically the, the father of the software that we use. The picture behind on the big screen is 424 in the virtual world, and that software has been built by Eddie. Okay, so without meeting Eddie a lot of what we're doing wouldn't exist today. So you see the importance of having met these, these key people over the, Eddie I met uh, probably five years ago now. 
uh, and Augusto came to us. We were so lucky to have the right people coming at the right time so we could build this digital uh, virtual platform. Johan at the back in the middle, a young engineer uh, coming out of university and he's done a, a great amount of work over the past year, you know, with some design work and also helping. We went to the Autosport International in January and he was uh, a big part of organizing that with, with me. And Alex has been a big part of the team as well, social media and, and great support to, um, throughout, throughout a, a few years now. So you see, it's a small core team. We call it the core team. And everything we do is public. Everything we do is shared with the community. And you're part of this community. And we call this community our team, OK? As far as we're concerned, we're all in, in one big team. I call it a better team because I think this will create more value than traditional teams. And I believe that the future of motorsport is more accessible, more collaborative, and more digital. And by the way, we're also we, we are all about sustainability as well. But when I think of sustainability, I think of more digital and less physical. That's why we do a lot of online meetings. We will not have, you know, a, a big factory or headquarters, and we are more working in the digital space. This is the topic of today, simulation and modeling as well. Okay. And the openness and the transparent uh, way of working, again, is to create this big, big uh, community that, that will really feel part of this team in a new way. I'll let you read this later, and that explains why you know I build hair in this way. But really, I know you're here for mainly for the car and the engineering. So most of you will know that we are developing this amazing electric hypercar called 424. I've started this 13 years ago. Initially, it was an LMP1 that was hybrid, petrol, and electric. But with my with the experiences I had, and I you know, was involved with a NEO project seven years ago that broke the electric record at the Nürburgring called the NEO EP9, completely fell in love with the electric drivetrain, and realized there is an opportunity here. I take the LMP1 car and convert it into electric. And today, this car is designed to be 800 kilowatts of power. Uh, think of Formula E is 300 kilowatts. Okay, so it's in fact using three electric motors from Formula E. The limitation, so it's not 900 kilowatts, the limit is on battery, and I'll explain that later. And the aerodynamics is also extremely advanced. And I can't wait to do the aer aerodynamics module next week. Uh, aerodynamics is one of my big passion, and I learned it in Formula One at Williams. Um, and I will want, I will not go into details right now, but a lot of people have come to me and say, 424 looks uh, not so developed. It looks a bit like a box. And I, want, I will want to explain why, after so many years of development, the car has come from looking very rounded and surfaced and maybe more developed, but less performance than what it has now, to something much more structured and using more flats and extruded uh, components on, uh, in terms of design. Uh, but the perf I can tell you one thing. The, the aerodynamic performance of 424 is higher than anything I've worked on before. And I've done Formula One and I've done Le Mans. OK, we are not regulated. Um, so we are not following regulation for performance. We follow regulation for safety. But believe me, the aerodynamic performance, it's got an L over D, so if aerodynamic efficiency of 5.5 to 1, which is higher than anything racing at the moment. Um, and it's really gone through a, a very long process of unit testing optimization. You know, it's it's had more than 3,000 steps, uh, optimization steps on it. When I do aerodynamic module, I'll explain exactly what, what that means. So again, there's a lot of, in, of time uh, and optimization that's gone into what you're seeing on screen right now. In the short term, this car is all about breaking the Nürburgring lap records. And I, I know all of you are aware that I've been working on this for a while. It's an extremely difficult challenge. Uh, it's dangerous, it's, uh, you know, it's difficult, and that's why I want to do it. And that's why we're doing it, because beating Porsche, and you've seen the lap at the Nürburgring of the 919, is, uh, you know, it's extremely fast and it's difficult. It's, it's a massive challenge, and I absolutely love it. Plus, we're coming to a point where the electric 
powertrain becomes the perfect weapon for that mission. Uh, that gives us the uh, basically the advantage over the hybrids of the, the 919 hybrids. And I'll show some speed traces and I'll explain how we how we are going to do this. So that's going to happen over the next couple of years. There's still challenges ahead, mainly commercial and raising the funding. Technically, we've, we've answered all the questions today. We know exactly how we're going to build this car for the Nürburgring. Uh, to raise the money for to build the car is is the challenge right now. But I wanted to I wanted to do it this way. For me, it was engineering first, and now we're going to sort out the commercials, because I want to sell something that I know will work. Okay, and it's again it's not traditional. Traditionally, you know, projects they put the funding together first, and then they sort out the engineering. But there's been stories, you know, in the past, especially for projects like this. When you're trying to really push the boundaries and create new performance levels, it's too dangerous to do that the other way around. You know, you need to make sure what you're trying to buy or what you're trying to build and what performance level um, you're trying to achieve. Long term, Le Mans 24 hours. And it will be a hybrid, uh, sorry, not, absolutely not hybrid. It will be hydrogen fuel cell. So still completely electric. So the motors and the gearbox will be kept from the Nürburgring version. But instead of having just one big battery, you'll have a hydrogen hydrogen fuel cell connected to a smaller battery, and it will allow the car to, to drive for much longer. Because the Nürburgring version, the battery version, can only do five minutes, and then the battery is flat. So it's a different challenge, OK? The short term is the, what we call the speed challenge. I want to show that 44 is the fastest electric car. And then we take still the same platform and the same team. A pairing team will, will go to the to Le Mans and it's the endurance challenge. And the car will not go as fast as the Nürburgring version, but it will go for much longer. One of the, as I said, one of the big challenges commercial and is bringing a network of really great companies with us. And to this day, there's not one company that has signed a contract with us because that is starting now. All I have done is gone around and made sure I completely understand the supply chain and where we're going to go and source everything. All we know is it will for tires, it will be people like Michelin, and we'll, we've worked with them just to make sure they can do it for us and what they're going to do. And then, you know, for composites, it will be Formula One suppliers for electric drive frames, it will be Formula E supplier. But I cannot give you the exact company just yet, because as we speak, I'm working on you know, uh, signing contracts with these people. OK, and we, we also have a great partner in PTC. It's on the car, and PTC does this software called Onshape, and Onshape is where we design the car. So PTC Onshape. I'm sure most of you know Onshape, this new CAD system in the cloud, and they've been a great partner for us. They've allowed us to you know, get access to tools to design the car uh, all these years, and I really want to build on that relationship with them as well. They're a great company. I'll pass on this section about sustainability and also how we do things, but a lot of the accessibility and the transparency and and of course, the cars are zero emission. That's one thing. But we want to go much further. The social aspect is important. What we leave behind. And that's why today, what I'm doing today is part of the strategy and the mission of Perrin. You know, we want to leave something behind and give access to, to you guys, to all the engineering that is behind what we are doing. And the last part is the governance. And the governance is also allowing anybody to take ownership of partnership of, of our team. And this is the um, this is the contribute uh, program that we have. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more in a minute. But effectively, anybody can invest into pairing four to four. Some great companies have helped us in that, what I call the digital phase. It's that phase where we haven't built anything, but everything we've done is digital. Um, Again, I feel sometimes like we've been lucky. You know, I, I said we've been lucky to meet the, some key people. 
uh, on the web, but we've also been lucky to to link with some great companies. So PTC Onshape has been a big part of helping us to get to where we are now. Dynisma is another one. So Dynisma is this motion platform, simulation platform, so simulator in the UK, in Bristol. There's their Formula One um, people who have started this company, so their product is the best in class, best simulator you can find in the world. Gives you the, you know, immersion, uh, the best immersion you can uh, imagine in terms of driving the car in the virtual world. When you sit in this cockpit and you drive, and you feel all the vibration and, and the car around the Nurburgring, it really feels like you're driving the real thing. So it's been great to have this partnership, and we are going to keep going to Dynisma, both for a an engineering point of view. Obviously, we do testing, but not a lot of testing we do there because access to the platform is, um, you know, is we don't have much uh, many days in the year where we can do that because it needs bringing the team in the UK. Um, most of the testing is done actually by Augusto and Damien on their own rig at home. But what it does as well is it links us to a, a new network and it raises the profile of the project. Okay, it's great to be linked with companies like this and it's high profile and it shows that our software can run on such platform. BPP is that software uh, from Eddy, um, the simulation software that uh, we are developing with Eddy and this is our virtual um, testing platform. Bramble is where we do all our CFD, and it's a company Total Sim in the UK, and I'll show you uh, some models today. And we've worked with a company, Protogen 3D, on, on uh, in fact, the model you see behind me uh, has been printed this year. I'll, I'll go quick on, basically, you, that's my uh, resume, but I want to, uh, you know, I need to put this here because the people who want we will come to support this also need to trust that in effect the engineering behind is coming from experience and, and effectively i've built my career around this project i knew from a very early on from 20 years ago that i will i would want to develop such cars this is why i did you know i started at courage and pescarolo at le mans as race engineer but uh went to f1 but from being a race engineer i, I switched into being a designer aerodynamicist, which actually to this day, the I'm friends sorry. I have in Formula One, really? either race engineers or they are designers. I don't know anyone who's, who actually has jumped between the two. It used to be uh, the case, uh, you know, 30 years ago when teams were much smaller, people like um, Adrian Newey and uh, some, you know, uh, Ross Brown and these people used to do a bit of everything. But nowadays, our generation, I haven't seen really anybody who's done detailed design or aerodynamics, wind tunnel testing as much as race engineering. And, and I pushed myself to do that because I wanted to be able to drive such projects like 424. Okay. I'm still involved in the Jaguar Formula E as a, as a consultant. Uh, and that's been really good. Uh, especially to keep a, a foot in the industry for that electric powertrain knowledge. But um, yeah, it's been great. I've been working with JAG for uh, nearly six years now. And, you know, we when I started, we were pretty much back of the grid and the team has grown so much. And for those of you who follow Formula E, Jaguar is now at the very front and we are winning races and hopefully the championship this year. Uh, but there, there was a great momentum in Jaguar when I when I joined. So I was lucky to be part of that. So just to finish on that uh, presentation of Perrin, uh, as you all know, Perrin.com is where is, is where the core team really works. I'll, pr I'll press on this uh, button here. And you've all seen Perrin.com, but it's like, think of it as a dashboard that's public. This is where you see when the next meetings are. You can join the meetings. So obviously, we've got the Fort for School running now. We do our core meeting teams every week. In fact, the next one is in two weeks. We cannot do next week. Uh, you're also welcome to join these meetings when you want. And, and you know, this is very much an hour for us to talk about the current developments. This is open to everyone as well. Um, I put a lot of chats in there and what I do on a daily basis. And Eddie, Eddie here, actually, is also putting his developments. And Alex is working there, Johan, and more people. In fact, here you also access the list of all the contributors that have contributed to the project from the start. 
there's 82 people in there. And you can you can add your name to this if you want today, just by going on contribute and, and making a small investment in there. By the way, when you do an investment, it gives you digital credit that will that are logged in our database the same way as all the all the contributions done to date. And in the future, we will have a system where you can exchange with other members your your credits. Okay, so the credits will be reused in the future. So that's how that's a way for us to to develop at this stage, and that's been really powerful for the digital phase of the project. So if I come back here. Um, again, don't hesitate to come and visit pairing.com and see what's going on every day. You can see four hours, five hours, six hours ago. Every day messages are posted here. We have a system where Eddie or I or anybody in the system with a contract, each time you spend an hour, you put this sign superior than for one hour and then two, three, four, five. Eddie's worked five hours on this today. And then it's credited automatically. And I do the same, and everybody does the same. I wanted to show you a little bit how we work at, at Perrin or the core team. OK, so that's the core team. The WhatsApp, you're all, uh, I'm sure, in the WhatsApp, so you, you know how it works. And then we're on LinkedIn. For social media, we only do LinkedIn at the moment because we don't want to spread, spread our energy too thin. Um, so we're focusing on, on LinkedIn. I post regularly, and then Alex is helping on the parent for four page. And just to make sure everyone understands why we're doing this, you know, we want to help the world to become a team. That's the vision of Perrin. We, you know, we are, we are really trying to, to go beyond the, the you know, countries and boundary um, borders and create a new layer of, of community that achieves amazing things, right? OK, so let's jump. Uh, on to what you're here for today. Uh, so if you go in 424, School of Engineering, Modules, uh, and then these are the modules we're going to cover, and today is Simulation and Modeling. Uh, I actually worked on these pages as we go, so expect all the pages to, to change as we go. So I've, I've really developed that one uh, for this, this module, and then the others will be updated. OK, so today, uh, so we spent half an hour. So let's, yeah, we've got a good, a good hour and a half left. And I will cover this page with you today. And um, basically, just to give you an overview, we're going to talk about what we do for offline lab time simulation. And I'll show you exactly what that is. The dynamic lab simulation is the big you know, it's the big software we're developing with Eddie and, and other people, by the way, not only Eddie, but uh, we, we had Manuel, Helio. You know, there's so many people involved uh, that have contributed to that software in particular. Um, this is where we can drive the car. Uh, and it's it's fantastic tool. So I'll show you how you can access this, what we do with it, OK? I'll browse for our CAD model as well because this is modeling and simulation, and part of it is, is the CAD model. And that's done in Onshape, as I said. Aerodynamics, I'll talk about that. But obviously, next week, we have an in-depth aerodynamics module, where I go much further into every step of development of 4 to 4. A bit of stress analysis, mainly explaining what, we, what we've done so far and how we go about it. And then tire, there's a little section on tire model because it's an interesting, uh, it's an important part of what we do. Okay. After each section, we'll have quick uh, question answers. Okay. So simulation and modeling. Uh, I put it here that really that's what makes pairing four to four possible. Okay. I said um, that effectively it's digital. It's a digital first project. Traditionally, we would build something and then we would create a model out of it later. But obviously, everything's changed with the advanced advancement of computers and digital models. Um, and when I, since I've started my career, I've seen a massive increases in in making decisions in the digital world, and not so much more in the physical world. Why? Because it it just costs too much to keep building prototypes. 
So what you want to do is mod have amazing models that you use to effectively develop your, your car. Uh, and in that digital space, you can make some key decisions before you even build a car. And with 4 to 4, we've gone ex extreme with this because we have never built anything yet. We want to really have certainty of performance and solutions before we then start building. And that will be the one version we'll build for the Nürburgring, OK? So one thing we want to know is what lap time the car is going to achieve. And when when you uh, when you think of lap time, there's there's two distinct way of mod modeling lap time. There's what we call offline lap time simulation, uh, which is basically doesn't have a driver or a driver model. It's a very simple uh, model, and I'll show you the parameters. It's extremely simple, but it gives you a very quick way to assess sensitivity to some key parameters and run just like a. It, it's what we call a quasi-static point model. It's not even dynamic in the sense of uh, transitioning between braking and, sorry, accelerating and braking, for example, is not purely dynamic. So there's no motion of the chassis and things like that. It's pure, it's dynamic from a, a point of view of point mass accelerating and braking and cornering on a, on a given trajectory. So it's a very simplistic way of uh assessing lap time but it's you can do so much with it that software here that i'm going to show you is actually a i build this software i started it at reynard my first job 20 25 years ago and i've kept developing it it's like an excel you know uh script uh, but it it really works well and i've used it a lot for four to four even this week i was still using it because we had done a bit more optimization this week so what you want to what you want to achieve with this is come up with speed traces. Okay, so this is this is the speed of four to four around the Nurburgring. The lap is about twenty one kilometers long, and here you've got different tests done. In fact, the blue the blue trace here that looks a bit different, that speed trace you see is coming from Unity. It's coming from our driving simulation. You can see some key areas where the speed is different. You see this area where the where the speed drops down to 300 kilometers an hour flat. Here it drops as well. The reason is because there are some sections around the Nurburgring where we apply a speed limiter, and we will in the real car, because the the track is has got very uh, aggressive crests, and if we don't limit the speed, the car will will lose contact with the ground, potentially lose. Uh, you know, potentially start to be in unstable and fly. We've had that in our simulation. Uh, so that's that's an interesting thing to keep in mind. So there are three speed limiter areas around the Nurburgring. But the other simulations, we don't have the speed limiter in that lap simulation offline tool that I'm, I'm using here. Uh, but it's OK, because we the rest of the lap is extremely close. And we are looking at sensitivities here. What, what I've done here is a it's basically a sweep. So it's I've changed basically the drag of the car, okay, the drag and the downforce. We have uh, you can see that in a straight line, that car only achieves 340 kph, so it's a high drag version. And then the we've got a speed limiter anywhere at 360 all the time. You see the flat line on top speeds. That will also be the case on the real car, just because. We cannot go over 360 kph, otherwise the electric motors will run over their speed rating. And also the tires will um, will blow. We, we have a maximum speed on the car. Um, but what I've done is I've, I've swept a different level of drag, um, which changes the downforce as well. So imagine the rear wing on the car becoming smaller or bigger. It's like being, like in Formula 1, you'd go to, from Monaco to Monza in terms of downforce so we call it drag level we change the wings um and basically the reason i've done this so now let's dive in into and i'm giving you like something we're working on right now so i want to show you like uh, examples of what you know the engineering we're doing right now so let me open the tool by the way you can all access this tool and copy it and 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 make your own uh, analysis 
the way this tool works is every column is a is a is one test is one of the speeds you've seen so here i've done seven one two three four five six seven tests which is the all the speed traces you've seen and for each column i've got a number of parameters so the car is simply defined by a transmission efficiency overall transmission efficiency of 0 0.95 a rolling resistance, so it will just know vertical load and apply a rolling resistance of 1.5%. The mass of the car is kept at 1,000 kilograms all the way. This is the mass of 4 to 4. We will design the car to not exceed 1,000 kilograms. SCX, SCZ, again, it's a single aerodynamic number, so it's drag and down force. We don't have an, a map here, it's a single point. Uh, so it's an average of the drag and downforce. The car doesn't know about ride heights or anything. It's just a single mass point. And here you can see I've been very I've been varying these these numbers. The first column here is a high drag, 0 0.992. So I always speak SCX SCZ. I'll, I'll explain next week. But for me, aerodynamics downforce is SCZ, drag is SCX. And 7.31 is SCZ in this case. Now look at this. These numbers here are the power. So it's the drive power versus car speeds. I said the car is 800 kilowatts. We are studying a 600 kilowatt version of 4 to 4. This is why all of these are 600 here. So the 800 kilowatts is the car that can break the Porsche record. Uh, but we're looking at maybe doing an intermediate version at 600 kilowatts. So this is a very interesting study, and I wanted to explain to you what I'm doing here. When you drop the power from 800 down to 600, you need to reassess what aerodynamic drag or downforce you need for the car for an optimum lap time. So as I said, I had a car at 0 0.99 to SCX, which is the car we designed for the 800 kilowatts high power. Okay, we found that's the optimum. But when you drop the, the power to 600, by the way, the speed limiter is 360 for every test. And these other parameters are the, the region. We have regen on the car at 400 kilowatts and an efficiency of regen. And we also have, I put a, a vertical load distribution just because it's a four wheel drive car. Um, but effectively, there is a small loss. It's it's a model just to to say that not all of the power will be able to be transmitted to the ground because you know it's not an it's never ideal and you get uh, you never have the exact um, weight distribution or, or or load vertical load distribution you need to get all the power on the ground. So there's an eighty percent here, but let's not get into that too much. So what I've done here is I've I've did a sweep of drag so i went from 992 down to 942 so it's a, it's a step change it's time and number seven is the lowest at 742 so it's a 25 percent less drag than the higher one and the downforce has, has reduced as well now the downforce to know what downforce i get for every drag level i go to this curve here which i have built over the years that's what we call the polar of 424 is the relationship with, between the drag and the downforce. Effectively, the high downforce version of the car operates very near the, it's like a wing before it, before it stalls. So what, what you can do is we can reduce the drag and downforce on this curve if we want to, re by reducing the size of the rear wing and mainly, and the front wing to rebalance. So I'm, I'm operating on this, car, on this curve with 4 to 4, okay? So when we sweep the drag, we also adjust the downforce in relation to the curve, to the polar. The other parameters are the grip that the tires will give us at two different vertical loads. We, we talk about tire model a bit later today. These grip levels have been validated by Michelin, so we know we can achieve these numbers, okay? They are not coming off um, thin air. So typically at at 10 kilonewton vertical load total on the car, you get a grip of about 1.85. So it, the grip is the relationship between vertical load and lateral force you can produce. But when the when when downforce pushes more, the grip is actually reduced. The tires start to saturate, so the grip becomes 1.5.
the the grip uh, of the track itself is all set to one because we are in dry conditions. Um, and that's another parameter which uh, is um, we set to one, but I'll explain later. Okay, so the results for all of these tests is that effectively we we we're, we're always uh, with the 800 kilowatts car we're achieving about five minutes zero one in unity you know in our driving simulation which is super fast remember the record from porsche is five minutes 19 seconds so we in in the digital space in our best simulation platform we can achieve five minutes zero one in this simulation we achieve four minutes 55 but remember we don't have the three speed limiter sections I come back to remember the speed limiter sections here. We don't have them for this specific simulation. So the car goes a bit faster, but that's okay. We are not so interested in the absolute value. We want a tool that then allows us to look at sensitivities. So when we go to the 600 kilowatt car, the lap time is dropped from 455 to 512. So we've lost 17 uh, seconds. But now what we are doing is look at the best aerodynamic configuration for that power level. And if you look at the lap time, it goes from 12.2 to 11.6, 11.3, 11.2. There's an optimum point here. Then it goes slower again. So there's a one second lap time to be gained by reducing the, the drag of the car. So effectively the fastest option on aerodynamic optimization if if i come back to the to the speeds so if i count the number of steps we are one two three four four steps so if i go back to this sweep i start from the slower and you go four step up okay so one sorry one two three four sorry four is this one that will be amongst all of this sweep, this is the fastest lap time. What it does basically is your, the Nürburgring has got quite a, a lot of straight line and a lot of corners. So it's not very easy to, if you go to Le Mans, for example, you will, you will reduce the drag even more for lap time. On this track, typically the best compromise is, is found at that sort of drag level, okay? So obviously you will gain lap time in the straight line, you will lose lap time in the corners, but overall, in fact, I can show you exactly the time difference. What is time difference is the sec where do you gain the seconds? So if I come back on this, I told you that we gain the second from five minutes, 12.2 to 11.2. And if you look at, these are the two different speeds when the drag has been reduced at the same power level. And here is what we call the time diff. And time diff is, imagine two cars starts together and one goes ahead and the other one goes, goes ahead in a straight line. So initially, the lower drag car is losing, lap, is losing half a second after six corners. But then in a straight line is gaining and now it's ahead by 0.3 of a second. I continue by the end of the lap is gained. Well, I think I think I'm using it's 0.6 seconds because the the speed I'm using here is not the, the one I was showing you. Sorry. It's the it's the next one. But you get the idea, okay? So this is this is an offline lap time simulation tool. I'll stop here because I don't want to, you know, we have more to cover. And I, I'd, I'd welcome any question on this, but I hope you understand the, the usefulness of such tool. So if, if anybody's got a question, please raise your hand. And then I'll... Uh, let me see. So anybody's got a question on this, on this uh, offline lab simulation tool? Okay. Okay, hi. Hi. So uh do you have any predefined racing line uh, to test to uh to to generate or all the charts or or this is the racing line may be specified for uh drag uh, downforce combination 
So your question is what racing line, what trajectory did I use for that? Is that correct? Yes, exactly. So let me show you quickly. So um, when I go back to paramet parameters, which is how I drive my simulation, I put the name of the track at the top here, not live. That's the name of one of these tabs that you can see. I've got a tra I've got a trajectory for Le Mans, Bahrain, Spa, Silverstone, Monza. Uh, used and the and the not live. And basically here is how we define the trajectory. And the way it's defined is there is five columns. The first one is time, and you can see it's 10 hertz, 0 0.1 second step. The second is distance in meters. The third one is the speed of the car. The fourth one is lateral acceleration, and the last one is longitudinal acceleration. And actually, all this data is plotted here. Where did I get this data from? This is coming from actually our driving simulation in Unity. So all you need to do is to have these five channels coming from an existing car or a virtual car. In, in this case, it's a virtual car. It's a 4 to 4 on the track model in three dimension that we have in Unity. And I'll explain. Uh, that's our next section. Um, so so we, we basically took this data and then that software analyzes this data and, rec and basically traces the, creates the trajectory, which you can see uh, trajectory here. You can see this trajectory in two dimension. Basically, it's purely X and Y. And that trajectory is coming from the car data I just explained. And then the, the, the simulation will run on that trajectory. If I change, if I change from North Life to Le Mans and I hit the simulation, it will create a new trajectory based on the Le Mans data. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes. However, if you if you, for example, change the the power, you for sure has to change the mass of the car as well, and then affect the acceleration in each of the corners. So uh, this is not so exact. In in this simulation, each of the turns is not that optimal as it could be in real, in real. Uh, yeah. So what what you're saying is. If the car has changed, you would expect the trajectory to change as well. Because in real life, the, tra the, the car will run on slightly different trajectory. But to be honest, the changes in trajectory are extremely small. And I don't think they will impact the, the answer as much. From my experience, I've worked with tools like this in Formula One, and it works really well. So the assumption is that the trajectory is always the same. And all you change is the, is the car performance that runs on that trajectory. By the way, I will to, to transition to the next section, I will tell you that this week, because that's how we work at Perrin, I basically took uh, this, I basically, I wanted to re-optimize the aerodynamics for the 600 kilowatts case. But I, I started using this tool. We did the sweep. I isolated that I wanted to go to an, a 20% reduced reduction in drag. By the way, I didn't choose the optimum lap time of 11.2. I chose the next one of 11.7. The reason is because I wanted to reduce the the energy spent by the battery as well. So there's 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 another parameter there. But just so you know that this estimation of 0 0.6 seconds faster and this sort of time difference you know changing between straight line and corners i then asked damien our our official test driver at perrin to drive the two configurations the blue and the green in our dynamic simulator and and then i created so let me uh, let me open it for you so you will find well it's on perrin.com let me uh, let me open pairing.com quick. And you will see exactly uh, what we've done. So it's in a chat called uh, test drive. There you go. You see this image here? 
the bottom is the plot I was just showing. So this is in offline simulation. And then the test we did with Damien driving and it's it's in a in, you know on the track he can change his trajectory it's a, it's a full driving simulation and we found very very similar answer you can see the obviously it's not exactly because sometimes the driver will make a small mistake and things are changing a bit but what you're seeing here is at the end of the lab we found the exact same time delta but also the way the time diff is changing throughout the lab is validating all our models but I wanted to start with the offline simulation because it's much quicker to find the point I want to test. Then I gave that to Damien to drive, which takes much more time. It takes him an hour to drive on two different configurations. But do you, do, do you understand the way we work for such yes, that's analysis? Actually, actually very convincing validation. Oh, okay, thank you. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> that's a nice validation, isn't it? And we, we keep doing that. You know, we, we do these loops uh quite often and and you can follow all of that on pairing.com live any any other question on that section before we move on because i really want to show you the the next one okay let, let's move on because really the big big tool we are using and i can't stress enough how important this tool is for pairing 424 this is very this is this is really where we put a lot of our engineering effort. Again, amazing to have met Eddie. And Eddie came with Manuel and Elio and actually Augusto, you know, um, to develop this tool, drive. And all together, we really developed this tool with all our knowledge and uh, and passion and experience to come up with a software that will really keep driving our development. And also create this really trusted way of of of, uh, of testing our car. I'm I'm showing you this video quickly, which I invite you to to watch later. I won't show you all of it, but it will give you an overview of uh, of what we're doing. I'll pause here for a moment. Here, there's two cars because we used to work on the blue one here, which was the Le Mans version that I developed years ago. And we left it on the side when we developed the new the new version. The, the difference between the two is the aerodynamic has been completely optimized for the Nürburgring. The car here was optimized for Le Mans. It would be about 15 seconds slower than the car optimized for the Nürburgring, because th this one is much is much bigger wings. It's more it's a higher drag level, higher downforce. Um, so it's been it's been a big step two years two years ago for us to really design that specific version for the Nürburgring. But as, as a reminder, we left the old version on the side, just uh, we call it the, the grandmother. Anyway, the tool we have here is accessible on GitHub. By the way, I'm showing you here, there's, a, there's a, an access here direct to GitHub. I will not go into the details of GitHub, but you can know that you can install that simulation on your laptop. It runs on my laptop extremely well, but it also runs on the, you know, in Dynisma, one of the best simulators in the world. So this software is able to run from laptop to sim rig to any kind of simulator that you that you that you know. And you don't need to have a steering wheel to drive the car. There is also what we call the autopilot mode, uh, and the car will drive itself on on your laptop. I'm using that all the time to do some testing myself. I, I'm not. I don't drive the car. I let Damien and. Augusto Drive, and then they send me their data back <clears throat> through GitHub. Um, when when Damien drives, to, he did drive yesterday. He did the 600 kilowatts, and then he did the 600 kilowatts low drag. And we have different branches in GitHub. And he, he posts his data, which his data means all his inputs, the steering, throttle, brakes are all recorded. And then I, I'm able to, uh, and you can as well, anybody can replay the lap on autopilot. And I'll explain how that works. But look at this video quickly. I'll, I'll cut the, uh, I won't speak for a minute.
I pause here. I've, can you see the DRS just opens? Okay, so DRS is like in F1, the flap opens. But actually, we do more than F1. We also open the flap at the front to rebalance. Some of you, I don't know if you read some stories on uh, in Formula One on the media for 2026, they're developing the new car. They've realized the DRS is so big at the rear for 2026, the car became unstable because you lose a lot of rear downforce, but you still have the front downforce. And now they're thinking of also doing a movable flap at the front. And we've, that's exactly what we do on 424. But it's also what Porsche 919 did. So we've got the RS, what we call the RS front and rear. The flap opens at the front and at the rear. I'll stop that video and I'll show you uh, the, ex the actual software in a minute. But you see, that's what we keep developing on. Actually, as we speak, Eddie is, Eddie is still developing a new suspension and tire model for the project because we've been asking for that for a while. And it's something that will be basically giving us a better physical model for the for the wheel and the suspension instead of having just one point of contact with the ground we're going to have multiple points of contact the suspension will have more kinematic um, it's going to be more realistic in terms of kinematic as well so we keep developing that tool all the time when you onboard the car you onboard what the car will be in real life you know you've got a dash in front which shows you the speed that speed is in meters per second. It goes from zero to 100. It's not kilometers an hour. That's why 53 here is actually 190 kilometers an hour. Um, reason is back. It happened that the speed limiter is at 360 kph. So I thought, as an engineer, I quite like meters per second. So we we work in zero to 100 for 424. The the delta time here is like the delta time I did show you on this plot. That, that plot here. You, if you drive the car, you will basically see your delta time to Damien or Augusto. Uh, it's a quite a fun thing. If, you, if you're somebody who drives for fun and want to compare yourself to our drivers, you can just install the simulation and drive it, and you will see exactly your time versus our drivers. And believe me, it's really challenging uh, to get to their level or, or nearly impossible. They are extremely fast on this track. The track itself is, is very difficult to learn, uh, but it's a fun thing to to. It's a it's a fun challenge. The car's in drive here. It's a it's single speed. There is no gear shift on the car. Okay, and then you've got a telemetry system on the right hand side, which shows you all of the channels that we have on the car. So we wanted an integrated telemetry system so you can see without having to download data and go in another software. And I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you uh, quickly how it looks uh, in live. You've got all your lap times at the top. So each time you do a lap, and then we create this thing called ideal lap in the boxes here. So it takes the best sectors. The, the The lap is so long. I realize that if you want to do some engineering testing, it's extremely difficult for the drivers to be consistent for five minutes and then come back and say that setup is half a second or a tenth of a second faster or slower over five minutes is extremely difficult to be consistent enough so we've divided the lap in five sectors of one minute each and after each sector the best sector basically of each lap comes into what we call the ideal lap and this is the lap we are basically comparing when we do testing so damien may or and augusto might do three laps in a row or four laps and then the ideal lap will be much more consistent because it will take the best sectors of each lap. And when they send the data back to GitHub for autopilot, it's using what it's using that ideal lap. So the autopilot is a, is replaying the best. It's the combination of the best five sectors stitched together. And then you've got uh, different views here. So let me. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch my my view here to the um, to the actual software because I really want to show you live how it looks. I'm going to stop here. This is the this is I don't know if any of you will know that Unity is one of the biggest platform to develop um, games, 3D games. So this is what we call the Unity Editor, and that's where you build 
software and models. It's it's all you need to be used to to get used to it to set up four to four differently and change parameters. But just so you know, it's all happening in this in these boxes. So when you when you expand pair, pair in four to four here, and you go maybe into dynamics, you start having things like anti roll bars, progressive suspension, aerodynamics. You've got some segments which are sections of the track where the DRS will not open. I told you about speed limiter sections. We have the same for the DRS not opening, so the car stays loaded. All these parameters are the aerodynamic maps of the car, which I'll, I'll also explain more next week, but uh, it's coming from CFD. And then you've got plenty of parameters. So everything's in there and open and can be changed. But it's obviously the user interface is not like a video game or something. It's very much engineering tool, so you have to to invest time to learn it. So when you when you run the simulation live, you're now in the cockpit here. I had to redimension my screen so it's a bit square. Normally it would be wider. Um, I can I can change what I see on that screen at the top, so you can see different visualization. Here it's looking at the front tire, and you can you will see the flap moving. That's the front wing flap. Then you can also look at the car from the outside. We've got our two cars here. And by the way, you could look at the differences, spend time looking at the difference between, between the two cars and how the aerodynamics has, has evolved between the Le Mans car and the Nürburgring car. You've got this mode, which we call the TV mode, and it will follow the car with cameras, like, that, like the video I was showing you. Let's go back inside the car. Here you can use the Q key. All the keys you can use are summarized here on the left. There's, there are ways to adjust the position of the driver in the, in the car. Depending on when you drive the car, you might have a different setup and you need to move the camera a bit. But the main key for you if you install that simulation is the Q or the autopilot. I will, I will remove the sound. It's already done. And I press Q. And now the car drives. I'm just going to stop here for minutes. I want to check which branch I'm on. So in GitHub, we, we're using the branches. OK, I'm on master branch. So this is the 800 kilowatts car that I'm showing you now. So the one that can achieve, in fact, the lap time, ah, it's not correct here. The lap time that, can, that car can achieve is the 5 minutes 01, OK? So I leave the simulation running. I go back in real time. Okay, this this is not the uh, that's the 600 kilowatts car, and we had a spin. Okay, so I will change branch. I'm not on the right branch. That's why the five minutes thirteen. So give me a second, and I will change branch. So I'm going into GitHub. I, I can I can show you that actually. Um, because this is very much the way we the way we work. So if I go to um, GitHub, everyone can see GitHub here. And GitHub is you can see the project four to four unity. And here are the branches. I told you about the six hundred kilowatts and the six hundred kilowatts with less drag and the master branch. So I'm switching to the master branch. I need to uh, restart the unity. Just a second. Okay. And and by the way, in GitHub, you can see there's the history of everyone who is contributing to this project. Uh, it's mainly Eddie and my uh, myself here, but we've had you know there's Elio as well who is doing the graphics for the for the car, uh, Manuel who is doing the user interface. So all our contributions are coming into GitHub this way. And also when we set new lap times, uh, when the driver drives, it will it will push the data on that as well. So that's our collaboration tool for, for pairing. I'm restarting Unity here. You normally don't have to, but it, um, in this case, uh, it, it stopped. So I'm going to share Unity again. OK, so we are back in Unity. 
I will play that. Okay, I've resized my, my screen here as well. Here on the reference, you can see it's the 5 minutes 01.6. That time has been set. You've got the date as well. Uh, it was April the 10th. Well, yesterday, in fact. Um, the, if your computer is not fast enough, you will have frames per second is what you need to look at. I've got a pretty good laptop and I run at 170 frames per second right now. As long as you get 60, it's good. If you drop under 60, the, the graphics is not, uh, the computer is not powerful enough and the graphics looks a little bit um, stepping, if you like. Um, you have to know that this simulation, actually the physics run at one kilohertz. So it's a very extremely fast physics behind and there's a lot of computing going on. That's why you can run a bit uh, slow on, on slower machines. Okay, I launch um, autopilot. We're gonna cross the line and st the, the starting line is here. And now you can see the time delta is reset to zero. It's actually not exactly zero, even though we're replaying uh, the, the exact lap, purely because there's some numerical changes. The way we replay the lap, is actually not a video. We're replaying, we're taking the car and applying the steering, throttle, and brake inputs from our drivers. But if you do that and let the car drive, you'll find that the car actually doesn't stay on the trajectory after a while, it drifts. So we have a little, um, we have a little force at the front of the car, pushes the car back on the trajectory. Okay, that's how we keep, that's how autopilot works. But it's very good because it means that it's still a dynamic simulation. If I stop autopilot, the car will stop and is not following the trajectory anymore. I press Q again, it will go on the trajectory with the inputs. And as you can see, we've lost eight point well nine seconds by doing that because I've slowed the car down. It's all dynamic simulation here. Now we are back at similar speed as the reference. So the time delta is stabilizing. I'm gonna, what I'm doing here is I've slowed the time down to zero. So I've paused the simulation. You do that with shift and up and down. If I press T, I've increased the size of the telemetry window here. And basically you can zoom in and out. This is like a, a really nice telemetry tool to, to just look at your data. So here you got speed, the gear, the gear is always one, it's a one, one speed the steer angle, and then throttle and brake at the bottom, okay? If I change pages, there's 22 pages you can scroll through. That shows you the accelerations of the car, the four wheel speeds. If I zoom here, you can see moments where we are locking some wheels, okay? Drive shaft torque, it's a four wheel drive, uh, so we've got four drive shafts the differential torque front and rear. It's a limited slip clutch uh, differential front and rear with a ramp. Chassis accelerations, yo, pitch roll angle, rates. Suspension travel uh, for the four corners. The damper speeds, front and rear, and the forces. And then the contact patch, loads for the so the vertical loads at the tire contact with the ground the same for lateral loads longitudinal loads i can keep going slip ratio on the four tires slip angles the powertrain has got some very interesting channels of how we basically take the power from the battery and divert it front to rear so the, the car has got what we call an active power balance between the front and the rear we are not sending all the power to the rear or to the front. We have, well, it's one motor at the at the front and two at the rear. So the, the maximum power you can send to the front is 300 kilowatts and at the rear is 600. But we are constantly changing the balance and how much we send front and rear just to make the balance of the car ideal going through the corner. These are forces coming from the ground when you touch, you know, the, the ground, effect, the, the touching of the floor to the ground. Aerodynamics has got ride heights, front and rear downforce, 
your steer and roll angle as well affecting aerodynamics. This is all here. And we've got the DRS as well at the top, opening and closing. This is the lap distance travels. This is the force feedback. This is important for tuning the force feedback when we drive in the simulator. So what we're doing actually is we're, we're calculating the actual force from the tire back to the suspension links and back to the to the steering rack. And that is the force we send to the, to the force feedback system. The autopilot is that force I talked to you to keep the car on the trajectory. We've got a PID, a controller system that is reducing, but that basically keeps the car as close as possible to the recorded trajectory when Damien and Augusto drove. Uh, and actually, if I, if I look, if I show you the white trace at the top, never goes more than 0 0.5 millimeter away from the trajectory we recorded. You see here, 0 0.6. It went further away when I disconnected. I disconnected autopilot and the car just basically drifted away. And when, when I re-engaged autopilot, it, it, it was 0 0.1 meter away from the trajectory, so you had to push the car back. But once it's on the trajectory, then it's very, very tight. Okay. Performance benchmark, super important. We have here, very excited about this. We've got the Porsche 919 speeds in white. And then we've got our speeds. So you can see exactly where we are going to beat Porsche 919. We, we even have the time difference to the Porsche 919. We also have the brake and throttle from the Porsche 919. And the way we did this is thanks to somebody called Hugo. Uh, and he basically took the YouTube video of the Porsche 919, applied some sort of AI or you know image recognition and, and took the was able to record the throttle brake and speed at 50 Hertz for us and then we put that data into our simulation and it's a great way to see what we're doing versus what Porsche did. It's quite impressive actually how the point of release of throttle, the brake pressure, look at these traces, there's two traces here, one is the Porsche, one is us. Very, very similar, which is a good sign because, you know, to beat the competition you need to be first understanding what they're doing and doing something close and just a bit better, that's how it works. So our simulation is extremely precise, you know. It also validates our track model, which the track model you see here in three dimension, we bought that track model. It's a similar track model as used in Assetto Corsa racing game, but it's a version specifically done for us and it's open source. We've open sourced this and it's accessible as part of the GitHub VPP 424 repository. Okay, and the reference lap is basically the lap we use for autopilot. I will stop here because you can see how big this project is. But um, I'd like to welcome any question actually on this. I will stop the simulation now. And I will, uh, I will switch back to presenting the, that page here. And we'll, we'll stop on that section, but have you got any question about this amazing software that we are using <laughs> to develop 424? Please raise your hand if you have. Okay, Bautista. Yeah, hello. Um, hello. You're using the, the, com the comparison to the 919. Do you already have some, some takeaways from the, from the lifetime comparison? Yeah. Great question. So what we're seeing is that, so Porsche was a slightly light, lighter car. It was 830 kilos. They tend to be faster than us in the slow speed corners. All the slow speed corners, we tend to be a bit slower in the, in the minimum speed. And I think that's to do with the weight. Where we beat them constantly is, I'd like to show you actually, I will, I will show you what I'm talking about. I will, I'm going to rerun quickly and share the screen with you. It takes a second. So I'm going to switch again.
I'm going to speed up the time. You can speed the time up times 10, just to make things go quicker. So I'll just go around the lab quickly. We've already nearly done a third. I'll stop when the car is on the back straight near the end of the lap. And then I'll, I'll share some insight with you. So I'm accelerating times by 10, but all the physics are still calculated at the same, same kilohertz rates. OK. We're on the back straight, so I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop here just before the end of the lap. OK. So now if I, if I zoom out, and then we go to the uh, okay, performance benchmark. This is the Porsche 919 versus us. Sorry, I can't put it bigger here, so it's a bit difficult to see. But you see the time difference just going down, 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 down. At the end, we are 16, 17 seconds in front of them. But if you zoom a bit, what you see here is that the white is always a bit faster in the slow speed corner. You can see compared to us. But then what you're seeing is that on all the accelerations, we are very similar. The, we, are, we are better in high speeds. There's two reasons. One is there's, a, there's, a, there's an effect of being in simulation, and we're taking a bit more risk, which is something we need to keep in mind. Because in reality, we'll have to take a bit more risk, and, and we'll not potentially be able to achieve this. But the car has got better aerodynamics than the 919. And the reason is they took the 919 from Le Mans and adapted it. But what we did for 424 is we designed, redesigned the whole car from scratch for the Nürburgring. So we were not limited by, I know they've changed the floor, but we had much more ability to, to go beyond, you know, in terms of design than they did. So we've got, we've got better high speed performance, but it's not the only thing. If you look at, most straight line, you can see we accelerate together. And then here, they are running out of boost because it's a hybrid car, the Porsche. So we've got the same amount of power up to this point. And then, they, and then the battery, they have a small battery for the hybrid system runs out. And you see, we keep accelerating. That happens a lot. If you look at this here as well, look at there. You can see how the boost has gone. Then they boost the car again. That's a different, that's a strategy, but they've lost a bit of time to us. Each time they do that, they lose about, you know, this, they've lost already seven tenths of a second here. So the, and every acceleration, we're a bit better because we are not shifting gears as well. They have to shift through gears, we don't. So what we find is the electric drivetrain is giving us an advantage. Make sense? Yeah, thanks. Very good insights. Cool. Any other question on this? Anybody wants to raise a hand or we, we go to the next section? OK, cool. So I'll stop, I'll stop this uh, simulation now. Makes my laptop uh, run hot. Um, and I'll go back to the. Uh, presentation. OK. So CAD model. Uh, we'll have a module about CAD where we'll go through a lot of details. And also, something I'm passionate about is how we design 4 to 4, how I want the car to be designed specifically, not just about you know, there, there is there is a there is a, a process that we like to apply to have the quality that I want. Um, but okay, something amazing again, and it's part of like the journey of four to four and pairing is meeting on shape. And the re when I saw on shape seven eight years ago, I thought, okay, now we can build pairing the team that I want because it's a CAD system in the cloud. And look at what's possible today by the click of a button, and anybody can do that without an account in Onshape. We are basically opening the CADs of the car. 
you can later on create an, an account if you want, but you don't even need an account to view, which is absolutely amazing. I can't stress enough the importance of this to spread, you know, what we are doing and how different it is. So I'm extremely excited about just showing you this. So everything I do here, you can do at home. Okay. This is the this is one of this is a document called Pairing Photo for Architecture. Arch architecture. That's the one where I put everything. Um, but it's there's multiple documents where people have worked to design specific areas of the car. But I tend to bring everything back in here. It's organized in sections of the car. Uh, in fact, the first one is a legality section where we, you know, where we have some what we call the templates. And the templates are coming from the FIA. So it's this is inside the cockpit. And these are the, you know, the volumes you can design things where the driver needs to sit for safety reasons, the visibility template for the window and things like that. Here is the battery. This battery is designed by us, but actually we are not sure yet which battery we're going to end up using. I talked about the 800 kilowatts, 600 kilowatts. The battery is the last piece of the jigsaw that I'm talking with some companies about now. Um, but the, the battery is basically made. This is 10 modules, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And there's 36 cells in each, 360 cells. Always that number seems to, to come up. Um, and yeah, this is, we needed to have our own battery model just for, just to know the volumes and make sure the integration into the car. But as I said, the battery will be done by another company. Um, the chassis is very much all the composites and the chassis, things like that. This is 100% pairing and it will be designed and built by us. And, th and this will this will remain open source as well. So let me make the screen a bit bigger. So it's nicer for you. That's it. So here you've got a nice bonded assembly. When I say bonded assemblies, you you can do things like isolate the parts. That's the intake bonded on the side of the chassis. This software is really amazing. The crash box at the front of the car. Um, and I want to show you that because, um, actually, sorry, I took the wrong, I come back to that. I want to show you the DRS system. There is another, the crash box assembly is actually here. Let me jump, jump to that one. This is an assembly at the front that actually holds the front wing of the car. But I wanted to show you there's a few elements that are interesting. We have the flap, so so the flap, if I isolate it, is actually moving around the axis given uh, here. There's an axis of rotation there. And basically, you've got, we're going to have two actuators, pneumatic actuators. The that This is a pneumatic bottle. So we're going to have a bottle filled at 200 bar of air, and that will discharge into these actuators through the lap. We don't have a pump for for lightweight uh, purposes. We just have a bottle at the front, and then we just discharge through the actuators. And at the end of the lap, we have to recharge the battery and we'll recharge the bottles as well. There's one at the rear for the DRS at the rear. And then these are springs. So as the car accelerates, the, the, the flap is actually, before DRS opens, the flap is already being pulled down. That's a nice way. It's it's called aeroelasticity, if you like, and it's a nice way to migrate the aero balance to the back as speed increases, so it stabilizes the car. So in series, you've got a spring, and then you've got an actuator in yellow, and the actuator moves the flap and opens it when the DRS opens. You've got the ducts for cooling the brakes. So you've got sections there. I won't go into uh, a lot of it, but a, a few things that are of interest. The doors will be a bit specific. They will not have hinges. They will basically they will basically 
uh, slide and then you'll take you'll take the door away from the car just purely from lightweight for a lightweight lightweight uh, perspective. So if you look at the door here, that's not what I wanted to do. The door will basically slide. You can see it will do that. You see the there there is enough space on the chassis. There is a a step here. We will we will slide the door and then it will go out of hinges and you take the door away from the car. So it's it's basically stays on pins. This is the lightest way to do a door. We don't need hinges like a normal door at Le Mans because it's just for the lap record. I just wanted to tell you these things because I want to tell you the attention to detail when it comes to light weighting. We are trying to remove as much as we can uh, from the car. We don't have lights on the car. We don't have certain systems that a race car will have at Le Mans. But for the Nürburgring, we remove everything that we, need, we, we don't need. In fact, the door on the left where the driver sits is structural. So it will take, if I isolate it, it will have a padding here. So it will take the load of the helmet when if there's a crash. But the door on the right is will be very thin and light. It's it's just purely like a, a closing panel. Just some interesting facts here. The battery will sit inside the, the monocoque, like a Formula E car, coming from under. But it, it will be very much integrated to the car. We will not be able to change the battery at the track. For the lap record, it will be as light as possible, so it will be very much integrated. Let's move on a bit. We've got a. Uh, our driver here is he, a bit flat at the moment, as you can see. <laughs> it's a two-dimension driver, but is is a is very accurate when it comes to dimensions. We even have a face to it. The reason is we wanted the exact position of the eye, and that position is what we put the camera for our driving simulation. Okay, so you can see the the use for that. The seat needs to be updated, by the way, because the driver position has changed, but the seat back angle is different. So the car keeps evolving. So we can go through uh, all of these models. You can see the transmission front and rear. We open it with the... So each end of the car, this is one motor from Formula E, single speed gearbox, and that's the inverter con converting the two phase Oh, sorry, the direct current from the battery to the AC alternate alternate current from the going to the motor, OK? That's one motor at the front. And at the rear, you have two motors. I need to update the cables here because they are not connected back. We used to have a different configuration. The two motors are basically connected into that gearbox single input. If you click on the cylindrical phase and you go Shift X, it does a section for you, which is quite nice. And you see that the two motors are connected to the single input shaft, and then there is another cross shaft, and then the diff. Okay, it's very simple, very nice. And you've got more models there, the cooling system. The main thing for me was we needed to build this assembly. We even do a, I'll come back to the CFD in a minute. We even do our livery model here. So we put the sponsors on the car in on shape. That helps Elio to then do the model for Unity by, by having the exact location of the sponsors. Um, it will take uh, a minute to open, maybe less. Okay, cool. You recognize you've got Dynisma, PTC, VPP. So we put the sponsors in that model just to give them a location. And then there's downstream work on creating the rendering images. 
By the way, I want to come back to this. The three images you see here at the top have been created in Onshape with the rendering engine they have, which is so good. You can see it's great, great uh, quality images. OK. By the way, I don't sell Onshape. I'm not a uh, commercial <laughs> for Onshape, but I'm so excited about the software. So I like to, I like to share that. This model here, so it's the CFD assembly. It's the exact model we are using in aerodynamic testing. It's coming from this assembly, from Onshape. So that assembly effectively contains all the parts that will be used for the CFD analysis. OK, so if you go and uh, it contains enough for the aerodynamic to be accurate, but not, not more than we need. That's why, for example, in the inside the chassis, there is no driver because there, the airflow doesn't matter there. But actually, we we've left uh, some parts here because actually that that's that goes out of the crash box into the flap, so that has an effect on the external aerodynamics, and the flow still goes inside the the chassis through the nose and goes out through this aperture on the door side. So this is where uh, the aerodynamic model comes from. You can see that the tires are intersecting the ground. They are not touching, they're intersecting. So you've got a flat intersection between the tire and the ground. The model you see here, you will recognize it in CFD in a minute because it's the exact same model. And to finish, this is the DRS rear. We've got two actuators opening the flap at the rear, and they are pneumatic as well. In Formula 1, it's a hydraulic system. On 424, it's pneumatic. Any question on the on the CAD? So hang on, I need to switch. Um, yes, please, Bautista. Yeah, um, how much of the design was inspired from previous projects or uh based on your or other designers' experience and how much of it was completely is completely bespoke to this project because I guess uh, I mean it's pretty co a complex system to create so um, therefore I mean yeah. I guess you have to ensure that uh, all the stresses and the, and the moments and, and all is uh, is re re reliable so, so um, yeah great question and uh, I can tell you everything is new. There is no, when I say everything, there are things that you don't need to, for example, the, the, the brakes and the wheel, that's a, that's a wheel that exists from PBS, you know, um, and the brakes are Brembo, mm -hmm. but that's, that's, and the tires will be from Michelin, so we have specific dimension. Apart from that, all the composites of the car, all the aerodynamics is, in fact, I did, I did all of it. I had support when it came to mechanical so all the steering suspension system i had a, a few i would say three or four designers in, in invested in this but i gave the kinematics we, we designed everything from from scratch hmm. so then we did stress analysis for 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 most of it and there's still work to be done right yeah, yeah. yeah. Impressive. <laughs> That's why I started 13 years ago remember <laughs> so i know it's a it's a live project but it's at the stage now where, even though the what you can see, the CAD, you can see, I call it concept level. As you can see, the parts are not necessarily finished. They're extremely, they're, they're very detailed, but we don't have the inserts in the car, in the chassis. We, we, there's a lot of details that need to be made, but that will not affect the performance. Um, everything that affects the aerodynamics is very precise. All the surfaces, we, we, the, what you see here is what we will build. It doesn't mean we, we still develop and we still are going to do more CFD, but the, the strategy is that the surfaces that you see is what we're going to build. And when we go into manufacturing, we're going to still have to do a lot of detailed design into the exact structures and reinforcements and thicknesses. So there's still a lot of work to be done, but we are not really spending time too much time on this because when we change the shape, we have to redesign the details. So I'm waiting for the budget to be together we do detail design at the end. Mm. Okay, makes sense. Cheers. 
Okay, uh, Arsha, raise your hands. Got a question? I can see Harsha. Do you want to speak? Uh, we can't hear you, Harsha. You're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, can you? Uh, we can hear you now? Yes, yes we can right. hear you. Uh, uh, firstly, congrats for getting this long. <laughs> um, no problem. And uh, I've just got two questions. One is like, um, are you planning to, uh, I mean, obviously uh, down the lane, so when are you planning to do the physical testing, like in terms of the crash and all that kind of thing? And, I, I, uh, I, sorry, I, I missed your question. You said, are you planning what? Uh, any, um, so when are you planning to do the physical test for the uh, design? Yeah. And the second one is like, in case if we want to get involved, uh, you know, um, how can we get involved with the team, like the development of the car? So the first question is, am I planning any physical tests? Yes. So, so yeah, absolutely. We do as much as we can in digital, but what will happen is the strategy is we put we will put the car together and we'll do straight line testing with the full car instead of doing wind tunnel testing and doing uh they will obviously the motors we use are already been tested a lot on dyno so they're they're working well um there will be tests for the battery itself that will be a, a bit different but once we put the car together we're going to just do a lot of straight line testing at high speed and just check that the the velocity of the car is expected the loads on the wings is expected if there's anything that stands out that is not expected then we can go to a wind tunnel to try and understand so we are trying to limit as much what I call dyno and bench testing as possible. We're going to do a lot of testing directly on the car itself, which is what I did with Neo seven years ago when we did the electric car, and that worked really well. So limiting the physical testing to the, you know, as much as we can, and and go directly with the full car, uh, but in a safe environment like a a big airfield with loads of runoffs, and do high speed straight line testing to start, and then go on tracks after that. As for being involved with um, pairing, again, as you can see, as for the, you know, I have, have we, we always have people getting involved and contributing. You have to realize that there is a there is a time to be invested first for you to understand the project and maybe follow and come to our meetings. Um, but if effectively there's something you can work on, we will support you and, and integrate you into the core team for sure. Okay. okay. Thank yeah. Thanks, Nicole. You're welcome. I'll I'll move on to the next section now, just to try and keep up with the with the plan. As we've got twenty minutes left, maybe we'll we'll run over a little bit. Um, so uh, let me go back. Okay. So I'll close the CAD now. We'll have a CAD module again uh, coming soon, and I'll dive into the exact way of the car being designed and, and more details. If I come back here, okay, a bit of aerodynamics, very quick. I do aerodynamics next week, lots of details next week, but I will basically just explain to you very quickly what we use, the tools we use. Um, first of all, what we are building at the end is the aero maps. You see this document here that you can basically open, and I'm doing it now. This is basically the aerodynamic maps we're creating coming from CFD. So we have, so this is a map. This is basically front, ride height, rear ride height, and the, the front downforce, SCZ front. This is a map from, for front downforce, rear downforce, aerodynamic balance, drag, okay, etc. This is coming from CFD. As you can see, we, we are not testing everywhere because it costs a lot of computing and time and money. And then we are recreating a new map that is as close as possible to the CFD based on quadratic coefficients here. So this is what we call the reduced model. This is a model of front downforce, rear downforce drag based on a constant, 
a linear coefficient with front right height, a quadratic coefficient with front right height, the same for rear, and then the sensitivity to your steer and roll. These are the parameters that affect the, dynam the aerodynamics of the car. When the DRS open and close and the front flap moving up and down. These numbers are what we put in Unity. So in Unity, our driving simulation, we, we are having quadratic models for uh, for our aerodynamics coming of these coefficients that have been built to match the CFD numbers. So I close this. And now that I've explained that this, this aero map is the connection between CFD and Unity driving simulation, where it all starts in CFD. We do CFD testing in Bramble, this tool here. I've put this one, there's a tool called Air Shaper. This is not where we test the car. I will open it now. I want it's it's a great tool to visualize the floor around the car. So if you're interested, you can go and look at the floor around the car. Again, next week we'll, we're going to dive into the details of that. But just know that this is not where we test the car. This is just one simulation that's been done in this tool that I'm sure a lot of you know. But where we actually test is Bramble CFD. Bramble is a is a professional. Uh, software used by Formula One as well to to do a CFD simulation very accurately. And as you can see, it's a bit less user friendly, but it's basically an engineering tool. And this is where we do all our testing. You see all these list of tests we've done. Um, and when you have a test here, you can visualize the results here. Uh, this is the pressure on the surface of the car. Okay. And for each test, we get some numbers. We get a table of numbers, you know, downforce, front and rear drag, mass flow through the radiators. This this is the way we test. Test after test, we're we're evolving the, the shape of the car to, to increase the performance. Next week, I will go into a lot of details about this. So if you're interested, make sure to, uh, to, to, to come around, but we'll record that session as well, of course. So I won't go, I won't do more, much more in CFD, but just know that the, the geometry that we use to test is coming from Onshape. I did show you in Onshape the assembly. We basically import it into Bramble. Bramble is meshing the, you know, the environment and the car automatic, automatically. It's based on open foam, which is an open source CFD tool. I've worked with Bramble for 13 years. When I started Perrin Limited, the company, I basically went to Total Sim, the company in the UK, and I bought their uh, license for, for testing, and I started doing aerodynamic testing. And that's where it started. And since then, we've been using that tool. OK, so any question on aerodynamics? Again, because we go into details next week, we'll uh, spend much more time. But yeah, I've got a question here. Go ahead. I will take the opportunity because I can't attend next week. So <laughs> the question today, okay. uh, actually two questions. Uh, do you uh, use in the simulation or plan to 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 exploit any uh, any parts that are elastic? So you have to consider elasticity in in aerodynamic simulation as well. So the answer is no. Um, the strategy I use is I consider the car completely stiff, which is not true in reality. But the fact is, the car is extremely stiff because it has to be for structural reasons. The loads are very high, so we have to make the car extremely stiff anyway. Um, and it's when when we, when we don't have regulations to follow, it's easier to make the car stiff and then to have the for example, that's what we do with the flap with the spring and actuator I talked about. The flap is actually moving up and down throughout the lap. So that's that's the the elasticity we use. But the way we use it is a spring deforming and the flap itself is stiff and, and rotates. Um, when you look at the geometry of the car, OK, so I'll open that quickly. First of all, aeroelasticity, we have to be careful where we do it. We don't have necessarily um, good reasons to do aeroelasticity everywhere. 
it used to be that it would be interesting to get the rear wing to be aeroelastic, so it would lose some drag in the straight line. But again, now we open the DRS anyway. So we, we have a very controlled way to reduce the drag in, in high speeds. We just open the DRS. We do exactly the amount we need. It's much easier and better to do that than doing aeroelasticity. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, when talking about DRS, do you uh, also use this this simulation to to I don't know to find the proper value of elasticity and damping of the of the uh, uh, of the of this pneumatic spring just to avoid any resonances that may occur yeah. here? Yeah, absolutely. So when we when we go back to Brambo, we effectively output the force, the load on the flap itself. If you look at the, the results, uh, I don't know if you will see it clearly here, but there is, you see these rear, they, they, they are some numbers that are basically loads on the flap. R RW is rear wing. Uh, so it, this is the load on the rear wing. F0, it's one, two, three, so it's X, Y, Z. Uh, so we, we know the load on the rear wing itself, but we also know the load on the, on the flap. You see splitter flap at the front and rear wing flap. So we are getting the exact load in Newton, applying and, and the location of the force when the flap is closed and when it's open. Mm -hmm. And this allows us to know exactly the load going through the actuator. So yeah, it's coming from the CFD analysis. You're right. And then from sing simple harmonic oscillator, you can find out what, what, what the damping to use, right? Well, the actuator is not a spring. The actuator is just a displacement on off. So there's no there's no damping into it. So risk of risk of resonance. <laughs> no, because the so the actuator is either open or closed. The actuator is here. You've got pressure on one side or the other side pushing. Mm -hmm. So we, I, I'm, I don't understand when you talk about resonance here. What is going to move and resonate? Uh, the flap itself, because it's... Okay, the flap itself, I understand. Well, the flap itself is uh, is very stiff, again, in torsion and and, and in bending. Um, so we, but we're checking with the loading that we don't get... Typically, you're building this, this structure so stiff that they, their natural frequency is extremely high. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's very rare that you see in fact, you see it in, if you look at Formula One and the rear view, looking at the rear wing, you don't really see the rear wing resonating, do you? Or sometimes a little bit. The reason, again, mm -hmm. is because these, these sections are built for stiffness first, and that creates in itself a very high natural frequency. So there, you, it's, it's very rare that you enter uh, oscill um, oscillation problems. Mm -hmm. Having said that, we could maybe enter issues like that. Typically, you will discover that on the real car. If that happens, then you rebuild the the, the, the component itself to a stiffer version. Mm -hmm. So all we are doing here at this stage is looking at the static loads applied to the flap, and we make sure the actuator is strong enough to, to move the flap. Things. From the different side, do you experience any uh, any problems with meshing, uh, as, as it is automatic, and uh, any issues when it fails, or produce a mesh of the low quality? Oh, the automatic meshing? Yeah. In Bramble, no, it's it's it never fails now. It's um, it's a software called SnappyX Mesh. If you want to look at it, it's extremely good. It breaks down the the volume of air into cubes, and then it refines the cubes near the car, and then it snaps. That's why it's called snappy X mesh. It, it snaps the the mesh to the surface of the car at the end when the cubes are very very small. So so it, there's no surface mesh on the car itself, and then ex, extruding of it. It's it's refinement of bigger blocks that become smaller around the the geometry, mm -hmm. and it's extremely. It used to, when I started 13 years ago with that software, sometimes it would crash, but it was extremely rare. Now it never crashes. So very, very robust.
Mm-hmm. It's, it's standard SnappyHex mesh from from the open phone package, right? Or uh, I believe addition from. I believe so, but Bramble is basically reworking. The, he's using that software and then he's adding more software to it. So I don't have all the details. Mm-hmm. I'm using it as a as a user only. Thanks. Okay. Okay. I'll move on uh, to the last. Well, I will not say much about stress analysis. I want to talk about our model quickly. Stress analysis, we've done a lot for 4 to 4, but we'll have to do more even when we get closer to manufacturing. Here you see a front assembly, front suspension assembly, fully kinematic, and then stress analysis on it. So you've got the ball joints and everything working correctly. That's that's the inboard suspension with the torsion bar. This is a, a crash test of the column. You know, if, in case of a crash with the FIA standards is that the, the column needs to move away from the, uh, if the helmet hits the steering wheel. So we've done these sort of simulations. At the time when we were doing the LMP1, trying to sell the car, we also have done, in fact, this was the chassis without the battery at the time, all the safety tests, but we are going to redo all of them when we do the final chassis for 424. Um, I'm not going to open this. We don't have time. We've done recently, we've done, we are doing now stress analysis in on shape. There is a nice article in LinkedIn. Uh, we've done, this is, uh, I won't open it now. We don't have time. But if you open this article, it shows images of, it's the back of the car that holds the, you know, the, the, rear, the rear transmission and the motors. Um, and how we've come up with a, a way of creating this sort of structure. When we go into the structure module later on, I will dive into this in more details. So just know that we've moved to a strategy where we're going to use Onshape more and more to do stress analysis. And that's great for us because we design in Onshape. But to, to finish, I want to talk about the tire model. So on the left is our uh, tire model that I just keep uh, in Excel and I'll open it. But on the right here is the tire model that we use in the Unity simulation. So if I open this document here, which you all have access to, uh, what you're seeing here is, uh, well, first of all, there's a, there's some dimensions that we, basically we worked with Michelin on defining a tire for 4 to 4. I gave them the, the Nürburgring data around the lap of the loads on the tires, so they know exactly the loads that the tire will experience. And they looked at which tire dimension is adequate. And they, they even came back with the pressure they will want to use for the tire. So it's extremely valuable for, for them to have you know validated and checked that they can, yes, produce a tire for us. The, the people who were doing that were the same people who did the Porsche 919 tire. So you, you see, we have a, we have gone a long way into making sure the technical solutions are in place. But basically, the grip model is interesting. And this is just like a summary of the grip of the performance of the tire. But then when we go into Unity, we have more in-depth uh, tire model. Here is just telling you, basically, this is the front. And this is the rear. This is telling you the, the lateral grip and the longitudinal grip at different loads. So this is for one tire. And you can see that at two kilonewton vertical load, we've got a grip of 175. And when the when the load is increasing, so as the downforce comes comes on the tire, the, the grip is going to reduce. That's typically what we call the load sensitivity of the tire. Even though more vertical load will produce more lateral force, that's true, but the relationship between the two is decreasing. So the grip is reducing as you compress the tire. Also, we have optimum slip angle. So the tire will slip at about six degrees at op optimum points uh, laterally. And then when you look at longitudinal model, we have grip levels as well. You can see that the rear tire has got more grip than the front. In fact, you can see it on these plots here. This is front and rear, and this is front and rear. 
we, we, we have a tire that will be a bit more powerful, we call it at the rear. This is the case for most race cars because we typically have more weights at the back. The weight distribution on 424 is about 47% front, 53 at the rear. It's, it's fairly equal, but it, there's always more load at the rear. Okay. So this is just, and, and also these numbers are important. This is the vertical stiffness, the loaded radius of the tire, and the rolling radius of the tire, and also the fact that the, the tire is growing with speed. So these are like, high, I would call them high level numbers. But if you if we want to go further and you go into Unity, so I'm going to swap now to Unity. So come back to Unity here. So you can all see that, yeah. And from there, there is, we have tools called the tire editor. And the tire editor, you can open the tire model that we use for 424. Ah, you can't see that anymore. So it's a, it's a separate window, so I need to switch. Okay. So now you can see that. And the numbers I was talking about were grip level. So they were the peak of the curves. This is, this is the force produced by the tire versus the slip ratio and the slip angle here. So this is longitudinal lateral. And these curves basically are described. So what I was talking about before was the grip level. So this point, the optimum point at, and, and the, the slip ratio for that optimum point. But, but in actual fact, when you simulate the vehicle, you need to start from zero and increase your slip ratio and angle. So these curves are describing exactly what's happening. In fact, if I show you more curves, now you've got a sweep of curves. Each curve is for a certain vertical load. And in fact, if I switch from forces to friction, now we see the grip as a number, 1.5. And you can see that the grip is higher at a lower vertical load and is re reducing at very high vertical loads. The same for, la for the lateral. This tire model, we have created it ourselves. We didn't want to use Pasesca or so of an existing tire model. We wanted something a bit more physical. It achieves the same thing as Pasesca, but uh, it's using our own more physical parameters here. We're talking about peak slip ratio, peak friction, uh, stiffness, drop off, ease out. These are physical, more engineering numbers. We don't have thermal effects on, on, on the tire and we don't really need it for Nürburgring because we consider the tire will be constant, consistent throughout the lap, okay? So I'm gonna stop here, but I welcome any question on the, on the tire model uh, or anything else. But we've done, we've done two hours now, so <laughs> that's pretty good, I'm glad. But yeah, let, let's, I'll open the floor to any question now. Um, yes, please. Uh, tire modeling is, is quite critical aspect. Uh, do you have any plans, or is it generally pra practicable in the in the industry to validate this model experimentally? Yes, it is. But what what happens is, first of all, the tire model we built. I've I've used this from my experience in racing, and it's extremely comparable to the tire models that I know. But the parameters of performance, I have checked these with Michelin. So what I know is the, the performance of the tire that we are describing in our model is effectively, we haven't asked Michelin to give us their model. We've asked them to validate our model and they did. Um, and, and they had only to, to tweak little things by two or 3% because it came from my experience of Formula One and MP1 tires. So the tire model we use is, is extremely realistic in the sense of the performance level. So I don't expect to have to validate this. We, we'll go testing with the car, and this is when we will effectively realize if, if you know, if we are accurate or not, just looking at the performance of the vehicle. Do you also consider tire wear in the in this model? 
I don't consider tire wear. Again, with the Nurburgring records, it's all about one lap. We will have mm -hmm. nearly new tires every time we do one lap. There's very little wear. Um, so we don't consider these parameters for that specific application. Thanks. Okay. Any uh, anybody else? Any question? Timothy, you talk about the Paseshka model. Uh, do you have a name of this model you are building, or it's is it state of the art in the industry right now, or is it really brand new? It's brand new. It's called VPP Pairing Four to Four model. <laughs> VPP is okay. the Vehicle Physics Pro. So again, I want to give credit to Eddie, who is uh, you know designing the software. The, it, his software is called VPP. So I'm going to open it actually and show it to you. He's got a website, and I want to give him credit. But we we work together, Eddie and I, to define that model. I used my experience, and then he used his uh, coding ability and and platform, and we we basically build it from scratch. Um, because we wanted something that we fully control. But again, I've worked with Paseshka a lot, and, and believe me, it does, it does very similar um, similar things. Just read a message from Matthew uh, saying thank you, but uh, yeah, I, I, I understand some of you will, will have to go now, but thanks for, for your messages. Um, I just want to share quickly. So if I come back to... Uh, to this window here, um, and then I'm gonna basically I want to open vehicle physics pro. So VPP, you've seen that on four to four on the car. Eddie is this is that's his software. It runs on Unity, and it's basically a vehicle. It's it's a software to build vehicles. Okay, and we decided that we build four to four into this this software now when we started collaborating five years ago we it didn't have a telemetry system the aerodynamic model was uh not what we needed for four to four so we 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 collaborated to build new features and one of them is the tire model we've we've built together okay great thank you welcome uh jitish okay hi yes Sorry, I just wanted to ask as to why was there a need for a new tire model when uh, you had Pasteka already? Uh, I've I've heard it's quite a good, uh, accurate model, and I'm learning about it as well. So why did you guys take that specific route? Because Pacheca basically is the same pretty much as what we've done, uh, but but Pacheca the parameters are not are not. There's, first of all, there's so many parameters. We wanted to reduce the model to a bit more simple, make it a little bit more user-friendly. So the set of parameters is smaller. But again, I wanted to use my experience to, to reduce what has been, I, I, I agree, Paseshka is a standard in the racing uh, world, but we're trying to build something that's a bit more accessible as well and more straightforward and, and come back to the essence of what we need. It's not a compromise on, the quality, it's more really rebuilding some things to the, our own way, because then we can, the day we want to add, okay, I'll tell you why, the day we are gonna add um, things like thermal effects, we wanted to do our own way. So we wanted to build a, a, new, a, a new platform for the tire model ourselves so that we can build on top of it. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, that does make sense. Yes, Paseka is a very, it is quite a, I, I feel I, like it's a compute heavy model. Yeah. So That's yeah, cool. that, uh, that makes sense. Thank you very much. No, you're welcome. Okay, Askru. Hi, hello. Um, I was Hi. wondering uh, when you're running the simulation uh, with Unity, uh, for the tire model, does the do you have steps for the load, or does it take the exact uh, vertical load for the tires? I don't know if it was quite clear. Can I explain? <laughs> so, 
you're asking basically if we so the simulation runs at one kilohertz so every millisecond we are updating the loads yeah okay yeah that, that answered my question yeah it to be honest uh it runs at one kilohertz but some of it runs at half a kilohertz so it's 500 hertz so the the maximum delay we get is two milliseconds on so effectively when you compute the next step you might reuse the vertical load from the previous step but the maximum delay is two milliseconds which is very small okay thank you welcome okay anybody else Bautista, yeah you're yeah. back <laughs> uh, did Michelin also help you design the suspension setup or were they only involved in the, the tire? Just the tire. Okay. Basically, all we discussed was, uh, and to be honest, because at the stage we're in, we cannot pay them to do a study for us. Yeah. We want to keep doing everything ourselves the way in the digital world, you know, space. When we when we get the funding to build the car, we will get them involved more. But we, we needed just the minimum information from them that they were okay to spend, you know, the time to get us. And for me, it was just knowing the performance of the tire because the grip level is the main thing to understand because the lap time will depend on that. But when it comes to, for example, the camber angle, again, I have run these tires so much in, in LMP1 myself. And we, we are normally, you know, the camber angles are very, very similar between cars. Having said that, they said to me that they, they tend to run lower camber now on the new generation of tires. So that was interesting, but we're talking maybe one degree less. So we had a, a discussion about that, but as the kinematic of the suspension, we decided ourselves. And to be honest, the, the actual kinematic of the suspension is mainly dictated by the aerodynamics and it's aerodynamics plus it's adapt if you look at formula one you the suspension is attached to where it can be attached because of the aerodynamics and where the, the chassis it's a high chassis we have the same on 424 yeah so the kinematic is very much dictated by aerodynamics as well a bit less by the tire itself and the tire works at very small angles anyway so we can consider it uh, it's different than if you do a gt car or something with much more travel on the suspension mm -hmm. yeah right okay. okay great thanks Anybody uh, else? I'm just uh, I'm just reading a, a few comments actually out loud. But oh yes, so there's a question. I was wondering, um, oh, is there a plan module for FEA analysis on chassis? Yes, there is. So there is a module called structure, and we're going to talk about FEA analysis absolutely. Uh, so, so expect that coming in the next few weeks. I'm just going to mute uh, Simon here. Sorry. And then that's it. So anybody else got any more questions before we, we uh, end the session? I'll take another one or two questions. Lorin. Yes, hello. Thank you, Nico. Um, can you hear me okay? Oh, sorry. I, uh, try again. There was some noise. So oh, sorry. I'm still on my way um, home from yeah. work. But yeah, my question essentially was... Uh, thank you so much for letting me join in as well, even though it was late. Um, my question is in terms of the sustainability factor, because I've obviously seen on your website that that's one of your main pillars that you're focusing on. And what materials are you specifically planning on using to ensure that you actually have a sustainable car that also performs with the quality and performance? Oh, I've, I've heard your question, Lauren. There's noise now. So, so you're asking, uh, yeah, so you're asking about the material we use for. I've, I've muted you, Lauren, just because it was noisy, but I got the question. Thank you. So, the, and, and thank you for your question. And yes, sustainability is a big thing for us, um, but we also need to produce, you know, the fastest car. We, our message will be powerful when we break the record. So we have to ensure that the record is broken and the car is as fast as possible. 
when it comes to sustainability, there's there's three aspects to it, as you know, ESG. So it's the environment, and effectively, zero emission car is the first thing we can do. I, I we do we will always do zero emissions uh, cars for repairing. We're committed to that, also because this is this is what's coming, and this is a, the exciting, and this is also for performance. It's a good thing, but it's also good for the environment. When it comes to material, to be honest, we will have to use traditional material from Formula One industry because we need lightweight composites, we need aluminium, we need um, titanium. So these are very traditional materials. If we can work, um, in fact, I had this discussion with the composite supplier, if we can work in reusing, uh, in basically using uh, fibers that have been recycled, we will use that as long as it doesn't compromise the performance so much. And we've, we are doing a bit of that in Formula E, so I know it's possible. So yes, we will push in that direction. We are also trying to find, make sure we find a compromise here. We want to break the record because this is how we are going to get our message out. This is how we're going to excite everyone. And this is how we're going to send a better message about sustainability. So I have to find that compromise here. But the other things we are doing with sustainability, and I think that's even more important, is the social and the governance aspect. And for me, I said at the beginning, the social is about what we leave behind. And I want pairing to leave a legacy and to make you know, high-end engineering information more accessible. This is what we are doing today. And we'll do much more of that in the future. And when it comes to governance, is also giving the access um, to owning and investing in the team to, to, to much more many, many, many more people than the traditional investors. So this is our way of looking at uh, sustainability, Lauren. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nick. And that was actually one of my concerns as well in terms of the speed and the performance. So thank you very much for explaining that. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. OK, great. OK, and uh, I've got a question from um, but, but say, sorry, I can't. Uh, tell me how you pronounce your name. Wojtek for short. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, as for the suspension, uh, do you have front rear connection as in the 1.1 and maybe an uh, uh, active elements in the suspension? So the answer is no, and I will explain exactly why. I worked with active suspension actually on the Neo EP9 uh, seven years ago. It's quite heavy. We had to use it at the time for various reasons, but we don't. Four to four, my philosophy of designing, and I'm passionate about this, is simplicity and really using the minimum amount of systems. I told you, for example, the DRS is pneumatic, not hydraulics, because pneumatic is lighter and it's more reliable and actually will achieve the same performance. Um, the power steering is also going to be electric and not hydraulics because we don't want hydraulics pump, but we have access to a lot of electric power with the battery. When it comes to suspension, it's a passive suspension, very simple, but extremely light. When we cut, when we do the record at the Nürburgring, the sensitivity to mass is very, very high um, for us. So one kilo is one tenth of a second. It's different to Formula One because we don't have a minimum weight. In Formula One, when they lightweight the car, they add uh, ballast back because the, the mass has to always be the same. OK, the center of gravity is going lower, but the, the lap time sensitivity is, is very small. With us, every kilogram is very important. So the trade-off, that's why also the differential is passive, is not active. Uh, if you want a, an active suspension, you need a hydraulic system on the car. That adds probably five, six, seven, maybe 10 kilos on the car. And, and actually, it's not something we need um, given the, the, the aerodynamics platform we have for this specific car. So the answer is no. Um, I'm not saying that this is not something that could work. You know, maybe we could find, maybe we could cancel the mass deficits that could be maybe of one or two seconds because of 20, 10 or 20 kilos and gain, gain it back with aerodynamic performance. Maybe we could. But I've chosen the route of more simple and make sure we're reliable. And when we build the car, it's much more straightforward to get to the performance straight away. 
because also remember the more systems on the car the more engineers need to be uh, here to tune these systems it becomes even more complex to get the car in the right performance window um, so i try and stay with more simple systems that i know work very well but maybe in the future with more resources and to make, if, if we're sure that it will have performance maybe yes does it also apply to front rear connection to, to have it to have an advantage yeah front rear connection we don't have either mm -hmm. again it's something that can give an advantage but it's in formula one it's mainly the formula one car is very sensitive to the front ride height so they're trying to on their braking for example to get the car the front lifted a bit to, so it doesn't touch the ground and they can lower the car a bit for for downforce port 24 is sensitive but not as much as f1 so this system wouldn't necessarily add as much performance as in for in the formula one car but also again it's the mass problem of these systems and the complexity of of tuning them um th given the size of our team at the moment my philosophy has been to optimize to optimize the aerodynamics the powertrain to a very high high level but not adding extra uh, more systems than that thank you okay well thank you so much i, I will leave it here it's we run over but i'm really really glad that i think we've had uh, maybe 60 people joining at some point uh, which was more than I was expecting. So I'm really pleased. Uh, this is the beginning of you know of a series that we are doing here. Uh, we are gonna we are gonna keep growing. We are gonna uh, do more you know engagement and share more and more so everybody can can get uh, you know this connection with the team and hopefully four to four will become you know like your car as well. And the day we beat the record. We'll, uh, we'll have this community behind us. So I'm really, really pleased that uh, we did this today. Thanks for your messages, everyone. And please uh, come back on the WhatsApp and give some feedback uh, to the uh, to the WhatsApp group there for the people who, who couldn't attend. Maybe if you want to write a message on the WhatsApp uh, for everyone to see and just give your feedback on the session today there would be valuable. And I'll share the link uh, of the recording as well. So see you next week for those who will come back for the aerodynamics session. Otherwise, I'll uh, speak with you soon, I'm sure. Thank you, Nico. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. I love all the emojis. That's great. <laughs> Excellent. OK. And stop recording now.